Hello, hello. This is Peter Nelson with Nelson Insurance Advisors. Uh, we are. I am back here with Logan Hertz from Hazeltine LLC. Hello, Logan. Hey, Peter. Thank you for having me again. And we are doing, I believe, financial malpractice part four, I want to say. Part four. Awesome. So um, let's dig right into this. If you wouldn't mind real quick, um, you know, you have the other videos out there, but would you just mind kind of summarizing the first uh, three parts real quick for us before you get into the, the fourth part? Yep. So we came across a case. We have a 75-year-old type 2 diabetic with a 69-year-old wife. Um, the vast majority of their assets are in their paid off house and in a brokerage account in the market. We are suggesting some other things. We're talking about the infinite banking concept. And what we're discovering is he already has a financial advisor uh, and that financial advisor basically wants him to keep all of his money in the market forever. Uh, he has not brought up things like a reverse mortgage. He has not brought up things like long-term care and he is dead set against anything uh, regarding a whole life policy or infinite banking or any of those other things. Um, and this, uh, you know, unfortunately is, is, is a, the, the training that, that some financial advisors give. And I think this, it's very illustrative to go through this. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think I, I just was on a, had a little spat with a, with an advisor actually on uh, LinkedIn recently. And I kind of just walked away from it because it was, Frankly, at that point, it, it wasn't even worth it. Um, I even bet the guy uh, s some money that my uh, the way I'd build it would pro would be more effective and efficient in the long run. But it just comes to show. And I actually used to work with this with this company I'm, that he worked for years ago. So it just comes to show this kind of divide, and it's unfortunate at the same time because we should really all be on the same team for the greater good of our clients, but it's just the way it is today. Um, and I don't think yeah. the government, yeah. I, I don't think the government has really helped things with determining these, this guy's a fiduciary, this guy's not a fiduciary, blah, blah, blah. So anyways. Yeah. And, and it's never, it, the problem is never the logic of the financial advisor or anyone else. This is true in anything. The problem is always the, the premises, the preconceived notions, the framework that they're working within, whether they realize it consciously or not. And usually they don't consciously realize it. And they seem to be all working within this very limited return on investment paradigm, right? Um, and they're trying to fit everything into that, right? And they're not thinking more broadly like we are taking a much bigger picture approach so that we, we understand it's not all about return, return on investment. Um, and also to your point, Peter, um, like I said before, the most successful, the best financial professionals out there uh, do partner with other people. They don't view other financial professionals as competition. They have the abundance mindset. We all complement each other and we work together. And I think, again, this is a great missed opportunity for that financial advisor where he could have partnered with me and, and you know done a lot of good for his client, made himself look a lot better. And we could have done some great business together, as I've certainly partnered with other financial advisors in the past, and I hope to in the future. Um, there's a great opportunity for us to be complementary, and we all get stronger together, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and that and that client that we're referencing here, I'm guessing that he's still sitting there, probably hasn't done a single thing differently. And, you know, he's probably thinking, is this the, really the best that I can do? But yet there he is, right? Yeah, and we'll come to that later. But one of the things that is interesting too is that um, you, if you have a financial advisor, you're working with a financial professional, great. But you at the end of the day have to take responsibility for your own decisions. They can advise you, right? But you have to be responsible for your own decisions at the end of the day. You cannot outsource the decision-making responsibility. Uh, to somebody else, which is why I want my clients to be very well informed and as self-sufficient as I can possibly make them. So I educate them as much as possible. So if I get run over by a truck tomorrow, they'll know exactly what to do. They don't. They don't need to be dependent upon me, right, for their decision making. Right. So, um, well, let's get yeah. into this. 
Yeah, yeah. So so we're, we've been going through some of the financial advisors' comments in an email that I have that was forwarded to me um, from the client. And this is where I'm suggesting that maybe we should want to de-risk, or I assumed that since you have all your money in the market and you're 75 years old, that you, should, you would want to de-risk that, right? There'd be some plan to like strategically draw that down out of the market and de-risk right. it. What I found, of course, is that there's no plan. Um, and the financial advisor is basically saying, leave it all there, don't touch it, right? So there's no plan at all. And this is where the financial advisor basically mocks my idea. And it's not an original idea with me that you might want to de-risk, that you might want to take risk off the table. And by the way, this is one of the things that financial advisors, well, I don't want to make generalizations, but some people, they, they never seem to address the idea of risk, right? They'll talk about a higher return on investment, supposedly, but they don't want to also, you know, dwell too much on the fact that, yeah, but you're taking on risk at the same time, right? <laughs> that return on investment might not materialize and it might be negative, right? So here's what he says. We don't agree with this idea of needing to de-risk your portfolio. We're long-term optimists when it comes to the market and the U.S. economy. Okay, stop right there. Notice how he completely misses the point. He said, we don't, we don't agree with your idea of needing to de-risk. And then he starts giving his prediction about the market and the U.S. economy. That's irrelevant. The fact of the matter is, you are taking on risk. Maybe you think the market's going up, and maybe based on your analysis, you think that's what's going to happen. That's irrelevant. The question is, should a 75-year-old type 2 diabetic be taking on this type of risk with pretty much all of his assets? Is that the right thing to do, right? The, your predictions about the future market are completely irrelevant, right? Yeah. If I'm, by the way, if all of my revenue is based around keeping people in the market, wouldn't you be pretty optimistic about the market? Yeah, it's it's always it's always it's a bull market with further to go, so you better get in, you know, and or else you're going to miss out, right? Mm. Or yeah, things are crashing, but that's a great opportunity to buy because now things are undervalued. You can get a great deal, right? Apparently, there's never a time to be on the sidelines with cash, right? Apparently, there's oh. never a time to be selling, right? Why, why would you ever get out? It's buy. It's the three things you like. I like to talk about, right? Buy the buy and hold, hire the risk, hire the reward, and it's just a paper loss, baby. Yeah, I want certainty in my financial plan. I don't want to deal with probabilities, right? To get to get back to our another analogy we talked about, right? You take out a homeowner's insurance policy, okay? There's a very low chance you're ever going to use it. You said it was 3%. I've heard 4%. Let's just say 4%. There's a 4% chance you're going to use that homeowner's insurance policy. Okay. Let's say he's the financial advisor is right. And there's a 96% chance that the market is going up. Okay. But there's a 4% chance it might crash. If you're 75 years old, is that a risk worth taking? If you think it is, then you should get rid of your homeowner's insurance policy because you don't need it. There's only a 4% chance you're going to use it, right? Hey. So again, so again, he's missing the point and he gets into his predictions. He gets into probabilities. None of that matters. The question is about risk, right? Okay. We can look back at dozens of events over the course of U.S. history. <laughs> Notice the lecturing tone here. I love it. Um each portrayed as the beginning of the end, and yet the S&P 500 has averaged about 10% per year over the past 20 plus years. Okay, first of all, average returns are not real returns, okay? Yeah, the S&P 500 might average 10%, okay? But your average return is not the same as your real return. I can mathematically show you a scenario where you averaged 10% returns over 20 years, but your real return was zero, okay? because average returns are not real returns, okay? And again, can a 75-year-old afford to wait, let's say, five years for the market to recover, okay? He has all of his money in the market. What if the market crashes, let's say, 20%, okay? And then he has some type of negative health event, which at his age, let's face it, it's not that unlikely, where he needs that cash all of a sudden. And he has to start withdrawing money out of the market at the worst possible time, okay? It's, it's not about average returns. It's about real returns. It's about risk, okay? And also, like we talked before, the sequence of returns risk. Absolutely. When those returns happen, 
matter tremendously, okay? At his age, it's no longer about how big is the nest egg or what's your projected rate of return. It's about how much safe, reliable, passive income can you get? So things like a reverse mortgage, which his financial advisor never brought up to him, despite the fact that his paid off house is worth more than all the money he has in the market, right? Never brought that up. Uh, never brought up annu annuities, right? Which would be a way to get a guaranteed lifelong income stream that he and his wife cannot outlive, right? Of course, he didn't bring up whole life, you know, because he doesn't understand who is. He confuses whole life with universal life and other things like that. Of course, he misses the point on the infinite banking concept and all yep. of that. And he hasn't brought up long-term care. They haven't even had that discussion. So yeah, the client, and... all, with, with me, just sorry, Peter, but with me just like asking very basic questions, right? I've already revealed several things that are super important that his financial advisor missed. Okay, a reverse mortgage, right? Your best single asset, your most valuable asset is your paid off house. How can you not talk about a reverse mortgage? Long-term care. The client clearly expressed to me some concerns about long-term care, right? And his financial advisor clearly has not had that conversation with him and is claiming that having money in the market is a way of addressing long-term care, okay? <laughs> you At one of the nursing homes I've, I've spoken with, okay, you need to have at least $3 million in liquid assets before that nursing home will even talk to you. They have a waiting list. You can't just get in. And of course, if you have $3 million in liquid assets, you better believe they're going to put some kind of lien on it to make sure that they get paid, right? Or you can have some form of long-term care insurance in place. Like, Which do you think is either easier? Saving up $3 million in liquid assets that you have to have parked to the side for long-term care? or getting some form of long-term care insurance policy, right? When people talk about long-term care insurance being expensive, okay, well, what's more expensive, that or saving up $3 million liquid? Sorry, I know I went on for a while there. Go, go ahead, Peter. Oh, no, no. I just, when you said something talking about the life insurance and annuities, you know, what a lot of people, doubling back on this long-term care thing, a lot of people don't realize that both of those, depending on the, the product that, you end up getting they both have long-term care benefits built into them life insurance has the chronic illness rider um there's hybrid life insurance policies we we do both of those right and then also a lot of the annuities now have a get uh, what we call a glwb a guaranteed living withdrawal benefit that if you end up unable to perform two of the six adls that payment will actually double while you know while you're unable to perform two of those six, uh, you know, assisted daily living activities. So, you know, it, it really, that long-term care thing, I agree with you. Um, I, I saw a recent stat that over 50% of all advisors actually do not have that conversation. And there's a reason, frankly, why 10, only 10% 10 of Americans have a long-term care plan outside of what I always say is the default option, right? The government plan. So it's, it's not an easy talk to have, right? And um, like you said before, that's where you bring in where an advisor, if they're not comfortable with having that talk, they could bring in someone like you, Logan, or like myself to actually have that talk and be a team, right? Right. I have a health insurance license and I have a life insurance license. I can sell pure long-term care insurance. I can sell whole life with a long-term care rider or with a chronic illness rider or an annuities-based solution. All of these can be great options depending on where you are in life and what your priorities are. But unlike this financial advisor, I don't pretend to be an expert in everything. So if I do the infinite banking concept, that's what I do. And as part of that, we usually end up addressing long-term care. And if we need a more robust solution, I'm gonna bring in someone else who is an expert in long-term care. And I've done this before where I bring in partners to do things like that. Okay. And clients really appreciate that because then they can see uh, that you're serving their needs and they appreciate that team approach. Right. Um, Absolutely. Okay. Uh, but I love his lecturing tone. Like he's giving us this history lesson, which is completely irrelevant to the point. Right. He's again, trying to showcase his knowledge and use big words and things like that. All, all of which miss the point. Yes. But you, you know, it's funny. You mentioned that though. Do they ever mention about how, the burgeoning national debt. Do they ever talk about how in 1989 the Japanese stock market crashed and hasn't re hasn't recovered yet from 1989? The 
at the point at that point it was the second largest economy you never you only hear the good parts you never hear you know they never play devil's advocate that's you know one thing i that i like to do sometimes is you know okay let's play devil's advocate for a second right and but you don't hear that from this guy this guy's all talking about like you said he's lecturing on the good parts right yeah and what it's a good question to ask with any financial plan what is the worst case scenario um, when I was looking at infinite banking for the first time, I asked the agent, I said, let's talk about worst case scenarios, right? And you can see in a whole life policy what the worst case scenario is. It's laid out for you on the guaranteed side of the ledger. You can think to yourself about things that might happen. And that's a good conversation to have. Even if it's very unlikely to happen, hopefully it is, still you need to know what is the worst case scenario, right? Um, and you're right, financial advisors just talk in, pro well, again, I'm generalizing, but they talk in probabilities, right? Uh, rather than what is the worst case scenario, which we do need to know. As they say, plan for the best, but prepare for the worst. And by the way, I, I saw a study somewhere, maybe I can find it, that showed that the actual rate of return people get is 2.9% in the market, not 10%. We're talking about your actual human being, real life client, because as Chris Kirkpatrick says, life does not exist on a spreadsheet, right? There are many reasons why people don't get a 10% return, even though you can look at the S&P 500 and say it averaged 10%. Um, part of it is just human psychology, human behavior, because also because life happens and sometimes you need the money. And when you're most likely to need the money and have to withdraw your account is probably when the market is crashing, because that's probably when it's most likely that maybe you lost your job or something like that and you need some liquidity, right? There were lots of people who in 2008, withdrew money from the market and they knew it was a dumb decision. They knew it was stupid because they knew the market was going to recover, but they didn't have a choice. They had lost their jobs. They had exhausted their savings or they didn't have savings and they had to withdraw their money, right? When you withdraw money from a market-based account, there's a huge opportunity cost. Whereas when you access the money in a whole life policy, there's no opportunity cost, right? You could borrow out $50,000 from your whole life policy to pay for a medical expense, right? Meanwhile, your whole life policy keeps on trucking, keeps on earning. And then later after you're back on your feet, you can strategically pay back that $50,000 policy loan. And your plan did not get deterred in the slightest. Whereas if you withdraw 50,000 from a market-based account, it, the cost to you is a lot more than 50,000. It's 50,000 plus all of what you missed out on that you could have earned. And, you know, Logan, let me, it's funny you mentioned 2008 because back then I was managing some money and uh, I had people in some really, you know, like American funds, for example, good, you know, solid mutual funds, right? Market crashed. And I'll never forget this one guy. He was, he was nearing retirement and I had to keep him in at that point. Okay. I, I was doing exactly what I'm at times so adamant against buy and hold, you know, you, you got to stay in it now. It's just a paper loss. And he really did at this point. And what did he do? He pulled out of the market. I kid you not. And this happens. If you look back, there's historical proof to prove this. He pulled out at the very bottom, right before things turned around. Okay. Um, you're right. That's why they don't get the returns. They either can't stay in it, they lost a job, they need the money, something happens. And I think you're referring actually to a Dalbar uh, report. I actually have that report here. Um, but yeah, they they talk about, if no one knows, Dalbar is a financial research company. Um, they work with the insurance and financial services industry. And yeah, that's, that's yep. spot on. And the number in the, the I want to say, I don't want to, I can't, I can't remember the number. It's something shockingly high, like 40%. The number of 401ks that get cashed out early, because again, life happens. Liquidity, access, and control. Those are the three things you want. Liquidity, access, and control. And the problem or the limitation with retirement accounts is you lose that liquidity, access, and control, right? So Let's go on a little bit. I want to get to the end of his paragraph. This is all, again, it's kind of an irrelevant lecture. He's just trying to, in my opinion, he's trying to grandstand a bit and showcase his knowledge, but all this is irrelevant. The point is you're taking on risk if you put your money in the market, regardless of what your prognostication is for the future. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> your portfolio is equity oriented. Oh boy. <laughs> At 75 years old. 
okay? Your portfolio is equity oriented, but 45% of your current assets are in bonds and alternatives as a way to mitigate volatility and provide a source of stability and liquidity when needed. Okay, stop there. That's not true diversification, okay? We've seen this before. They'll tell you you're diversified, okay? But still, when the market goes down, it all comes crashing down together. It's not like there's some sectors of the economy that are spared or that stocks go down, but bonds go up or something like that. No, this is not, first of all, I don't know that I believe in diversification. Warren Buffett doesn't believe in diversification. He calls it diversification, okay? His advice is put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket very closely. What I do believe in is asset allocation, okay, which is different. But they talk about diversification. The fact of the matter is, it's all still in this Wall Street controlled matrix, okay? Um, if you tr had true diversification, you would not notice if there was a market crash. Because what would happen is a portion of your portfolio would crash, but another portion of your portfolio would go up to compensate for that. That's what true diversification is supposed to do, okay? But just because you have stocks and bonds, and I don't know what he means by alternatives, does not mean you're truly diversified, okay? You are not diversified. It's all in Wall Street's control. Right. And then let me bring something up that this is, this might trigger some people, and I'm not making a recommendation here. I just want to be clear. I'm not making a recommendation, but I'll bring up something that actually does give you some true diversification, but you got to hold it in the right way, okay? How about if you hold physical gold held outside the banking system, okay? In the wake of 2008, gold went on an epic bull run. In the wake of the COVID crash, same thing. Gold went on an epic bull run. Again, I'm not necessarily recommending that. That's not, but the point that I'm making is physical gold is outside of the realm of your standard financial advisor. The best he can do is recommend you buy GLD, which is a derivative, which does not give you exposure to gold. And the price action in GLD is not necessarily a reflection of physical gold. But the point being, that might be some actual true diversification, okay? Just because you have stocks and bonds does not give you true diversification. Yeah, and that goes back to that, really, you're just talking about the the Ernst and Young report that they that they showed about the true diversification is they recommended 30% cash value life insurance, 30% in annuity, and 40% investment. So that gold investment, for example, could be part of that 40%, right? Yeah. And and again, when he says access for liquidity, again, not really. Okay. Whole life insurance is liquid in a way that these assets are not, because with whole life insurance, you can take out a policy loan with no repayment terms while your whole life policy keeps earning for you, okay? That's what makes it unique. So when you have, let's say, $100,000 in a seasoned whole life policy, it is not like having $100,000 in the market or in bonds or anything else, okay? Because that, if you want to access the liquidity, there's opportunity cost, okay, to doing that. So right. big difference, right? Yeah. Market assets, in this sense, are not liquid in the same way that whole life insurance is liquid. Yeah, you can, in theory, you can access it, okay? But there's a huge opportunity cost. And one more point, but this is actually really important. When we talk about liquidity, okay? One of the things that people obsess over, and I'm pretty sure his financial advisor is gonna get to it in a second, so I'm jumping the gun a bit, is the fact that when you start paying premiums into whole life policy, the cash value you have in the early years is gonna be less than the premiums you paid in. And everybody obsesses over that. And yes, there is a loss of liquidity in the early years. That's true. But you know what? What this financial advisor is demonstrating, when you put your money in the market, the amount of liquidity you actually have access to on a practical basis is zero. Zero. Zero, right? Because your financial advisor is always going to tell you, no, 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 no. Don't, don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. There's a huge opportunity cost if you do, blah, 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 right? Right? And he's actually correct. Like if you do access the money there and you start withdrawing it, there is a big opportunity cost, okay? He's correct, right? So again, the, I'm talking about the actual practical liquidity that you have in a market-based account is nowhere near the actual practical liquidity you have in a whole life policy, even in the early years where your cash value is less than the premiums you've paid in. Yeah, 
and that's going back to that, what you know, true diversified portfolio. I pref I also like to call it a war chest, right? Where, okay, the market's down, so you don't want to take the money out out of the investment part of the portfolio or war chest, right? And if you already have an annuity and in, built into it, and if you're already receiving guaranteed paychecks out of that, okay, so there's your your income is coming in, your income was not affected. You've got liquidity in your cash value life insurance policy, right? And you let your investments grow back. That's the power of that whole, of true having a truly diversified portfolio, you know? So, but it just, it doesn't make any sense except for the fact of the way I was taught back in 2002. That's the way the, the, the standard prototypical advisor is taught that you can do everything with an investment portfolio. No, you can't. Yep. yep. And they yep. and and they use that word portfolio, which automatically puts you in the matrix. Okay. I was thinking about this. Whole life insurance is not part of any portfolio. Okay. A portfolio is not the right way to think about it. But if you think about a portfolio, you're thinking about where is the final resting place for my money, whether that's in a you know, a stock a bond, wherever it sits, okay? But rich people don't let money sit. Prior to your money hitting that portfolio, it went through some kind of a cash flow management tool, like say a checking account. Let's back up a step and talk about your cash flow situation. That's what matters. As Robert Kiyosaki says, it's all about cash flow. How much money do you have coming in and how much money do you have going out every month? Doing the infinite banking concept is a way to greatly optimize your cash flow situation because now all that money that was leaving your personal economy previously when you're spending it now is not permanently leaving your personal economy. It's just getting recycled through your banking system. And now we greatly improve, improve your cash flow situation. And if you still want to invest in that portfolio, fine. We've increased your ability to do that. We haven't decreased your ability to do that. But right. when you start thinking portfolio, you're locking yourself in that Wall Street framework, and now you're closing your mind off to what really matters, which is what is your cash flow situation, right? No. And it increases the pressure on those assets in the portfolio to get the best possible return. Hence, you start making poor decisions, chasing after that ephemeral return, right? Um, whereas when you have the infinite banking concept, and to your point, Peter, when you have whole life insurance and you have this bedrock asset, you you will be more disciplined now and you will not be chasing after those returns because you realize you have this bedrock asset you can fall back on, right? Right. And I would actually, I would argue too that by going the, splitting it up between the life insurance, annuities, and the investments, you know, I was last night, I was, I stayed up late and I was looking at historical returns for some really good mutual funds that have been around for a long time, right? And some of these are averaging, once again, they're averages, okay? But averaging 12, 13, 14%. These are really good, good, good managed funds. Well, do you want to let them, the, those types of funds that have that, that good track record, you want to let them run, right? So pr produce the income with the with the annuities. Have the liquidity with the cash flow with the with the cash value life insurance, right? When those when those when the investment part is way up, yeah, you can take some profits off, right? But man, that that just makes the portfolio because, like you said before, oh, he's in a diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds. Well. What if we just got rid of the bonds out of that portfolio, replaced them with annuities and cash value life insurance? Didn't we just provide a, create a more effective and efficient, you know, overall strategy? Yeah, yeah. But it's not an either or scenario. It's not either your money goes into whole life insurance or your money goes into stocks. No, no, no. If we're doing the infinite banking concept, let's say we do want to put some money into stocks. What we're going to do is we're gonna take that money we've earmarked for the stock market, we're gonna pay it as a premium into our whole life policy, then we're gonna take out a policy loan and go and purchase those stocks. Now what have we done? Now we're making money in the stocks and we're making money as the bank that financed the purchase of those stocks because we're still earning in our whole life policy, okay? 
So that's the way to think about it. Before our money hits the market, there's a prior step that we're missing. And that's why Wall Street loves to use this word portfolio to, to immediately close our minds off to all the cash flow that they're controlling through the banking system and just think about you know, gambling with our money in the market, right? It's right. not a portfolio is static, but true money dyna are dynamic, right? True money dynamics are dynamic, right? So yeah, and you make a good point there, Logan, about loaning the money out. And an another powerful thing to do is what's the best time to put the money into the market when it's higher, when it's low, right? Mm -hmm. So if the money's sitting in that cash value life insurance policy and it's guaranteed to never lose you any money, you could put it into the market after taking out a policy loan after a crash and then ride that bad boy back up, take your profit, repay the loan, wait for the next crash and do it for the rest of your life. Oh, gosh, what a what a great way to do it. But that's not the way we're taught. We're taught buy and hold, higher the risk, higher the reward, and it's just a paper loss, right? Right, right. Okay. Um, eventually, when you stop wording, working and need to begin withdrawing from the portfolio to meet your cash needs in retirement, there's that word again, need, right? So what he's basically telling you is you're never going to take stuff out because you never truly, strictly speaking, need anything. So yeah, eventually when you stop working, well, let's you stop will, there. You know, isn't I think there a about... plan? Like, like, hold on, isn't there, he's 75 years old. Like, isn't there a plan for you to retire in five right. years or, you know, don't you have a date set or something? I mean, isn't there a plan for that? You know, Appar apparently, it's just, apparently just going to keep working and putting all his money in the market forever with no end in sight, right? You know what this reminds me of? You will, uh, I'm going to, something that I believe it was Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum said, but it's something like this advisor is pretty much saying, you will take nothing and you will like it. You will not spend any of your money. It's It's in there and... You cannot touch it. No, what? what is that, right? Yep, yep. Okay, so again, yeah, to your point, the practical liquidity you actually have is zero, okay? So, and we will likely want to readjust your allocation to add a cash component. So we know there's funds set aside for the next 12 months that are insulated from market activity. Okay, let me just finish this. And maybe further reduce the allocation to equities. Maybe, maybe. It's funny. He's talking about, you know, so at some theoretical point in the future, yeah. we might want to readjust your allocation. You are when 75 years old, when, right? When you're, when you're 91 years old, we're going to take a look at that. <laughs> right, right. Meanwhile, the market may crash. Oh, we'll have to wait five years for that to recover and all that. Yeah, okay. Make up for yeah, that opportunity. Now you got to stay. Now, now you can't get out because you're down so much, right? It's Yeah. And we laugh, but this really is tragic. I, I know. mean, this is tragic. What it what it does to people, I mean, it's tragic. It really is. Especially the the if you are married, the odds that you are gonna have some form of long-term care need before you die, I believe it's 70%. You or your spouse. Okay. That's what the feds are saying, yeah. I 70%. mean it, it's tragic what it does to people. It's absolutely tragic. Okay. Um if you suddenly become very bearish on the market, again, stop right there. He keeps missing the point. He, he acts like this is a, like we're both trying to predict where the market is going. And I'm saying the market is down, so he's going to go down, so get your money out. He's saying the market is going to go up, keep, so keep your money in. No, 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 no. Okay, That has nothing to do with any of this. Okay, We're talking about proper financial planning, which has principles that need to be in place, independent of what the market does, right? If the market goes up 20% for the next two years, you know, everything I'm saying is still valid, right? He'll probably dance a victory lap, right? And I'll say, great, I'm glad it worked out for you, right? But we, st but in, in fact, that still might not mean anything if you have a long-term care event, right? Um, so it's not about whether we're bullish or whether we're bearish. I'm not trying to predict the future. None of us can predict the future, okay? We want, we want to use a phrase I've been, I'm borrowing, we want a financial plan in place such that failure is not an option. Right. If you put your money in the market, maybe it does really well, but failure is still an option, right? We want a self-completing plan where failure is not an option, where no matter what happens, if the market crashes, if you have a long-term care event, right? If your home burns down, no matter what happens, you are protected and your plan will be brought to completion, right? Right, absolutely.
Okay. All right, uh, let's uh, go over one more thing here, then we're going to wrap this up, Logan. Okay. If you suddenly become very bearish on the market and feel anxious about your equity exposure, let me know. Is there are moves we can take to reduce your portfolio risk? However, I don't believe that's the case, <laughs> right? So what he's saying is the only reason you might want to reduce your equity exposure, Peter, is because you're just a little coward and you're feeling yeah. anxious and you're just not man enough to keep your money in the market with me, right? The the psychological manipulation here is just, it's just off the charts, right? Like, no, the prudent thing to do is not to take on risk, okay? Warren Buffett, the best investor of all time. What does he say? Does he say, go and take on risk or you're not man enough? No, he's saying rule one of investing, never lose money. Rule two, see rule one, never forget rule one, right? When they take on risk, if they take on risk, they do it in a very disciplined manner and they take steps to mitigate that risk, okay? I guarantee you these guys have whole life insurance in place. They've got long-term care insurance in place. They have plans in place. And when they go and play in the market, they buy put options, right? Even if they believe the market is going up and they're super bullish, they're going to buy put options. They're going to do things like that to hedge their bets and protect their positions. So again, um, it's just an excuse to keep all your money at risk in the market so that he can keep making his fees, right? Right. And once again, it's not about, I, uh, I got into it with this guy on, on LinkedIn and, you know, he was, he, I don't like to even t talk about commissions or fees or what's better, what's the pros and cons. And, but immediately he took the, he took the low blow on me and saying this or that. And um, it, like I said, if I just, the whole commission versus fee thing in a way, um, it's a shame that we get into that talk, but I do agree that when your sole income in a way is based off those fees though, um, yeah, your your job is to keep people in the market. It's the way I was taught, okay? Yeah. Even, even yeah. my uncle, I'll never forget one time he said to me, he said, yeah, all I gotta do is just keep their money in the market. And uh, I was like, that's, that's wonderful. And it didn't really hit me until later on and later in life. And I like, yeah, but is that always what's in the client's best interest? But yeah, I, yeah, and and I don't think this financial advisor is consciously thinking that. I, I don't think that at all. I think this is just the way he's trained. I think, like we talked about before, the higher ups, way up the ladder, who put this system in place and who and who who set this framework up, they know what they're doing. But your average financial advisor is not a bad guy at all. No. And let's face it, you know. Financial advisors and life insurance agents like us generally don't get rich, okay? <laughs> like the, the failure rate is pretty high and the amount of income they make is pretty low, right? So uh, we can dispense with the phantom of these like, you know, uh, super rich, you know, greedy guys in the financial industry. The average financial advisor and life insurance agent doesn't make a lot of money, but it is the way they're trained, right? And it, it's unfortunate, Um that that they're just locked into this return on investment mantra and they they think it's a debate over are you bullish or bearish on the market that is completely irrelevant are you bullish or bearish on your house burning down well it doesn't matter you take out homeowners insurance either way and whether the home burns down or not your homeowners insurance did its job right yeah absolutely okay well, Logan, are we going to, uh, do we have any any more to go on this? Are we going to do a part five or? Yeah, we got more to go. Um, okay. There's a few more paragraphs and yeah, there's, there's a lot to get into. But again, this is the part that people really need to think about. He's mocking, mocking the idea, right? Because he puts it in quotes and everything that you might want to de-risk your portfolio for a 75-year-old, Okay. Everybody really needs to consider risk, risk, okay? So if you want to put your money in the market and hopefully make great returns, that's great. But just understand you're also taking on risk and you need to take steps to mitigate that risk. And you need to look at what's the worst case scenario, not saying it'll happen, but you need to be aware of it, okay? So let's account for risk in the plan because they talk about rates of return, okay? If, if, if you go into like a private equity firm and talk that way or in front of serious business executives, they're not going to accept that. They're going to want to look at the risk adjusted rate of return. Okay. 
and and not only do we have to make an adjustment for risk, we also have to make we also have to make an adjustment for volatility because the sequence of returns risk. Even if you do get those returns, when they happen, when the negative years versus the positive years happen, uh, is very important. Okay. Great. So yeah, there's more we can get into, but All right. I think so. We got part five will be coming up next week. Uh, thank you so much for the slogan and. Uh, all right, guys. I hope you enjoyed that, and you'll we'll uh, you'll see us next week. God bless. Thank you so Godspeed. Much. Thank you so much, Peter.